Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us um, at the second Crawford Street and Walnut Park community meeting. My name is Lauren Bryant, and I'm the project manager for Boston Parks for this project and several others throughout the city. Um, before we jump into the presentation, I'd like to go over a few how to's and what to expect. Um, interpretation was not requested for this meeting, so tonight's meeting will be held in English only, um, but for any future meetings, um, please know we're able to offer translation and interpretation free of charge if it's requested. Um, so if you'd like to do that, please feel free to reach out to me at lauren.bryant at boston.gov. And I will also pop that in the chat a little later for you guys as well. Next slide, please. I want to make sure that everybody knows that tonight's meeting is being recorded and will be available on the project website within a week or so. Um, it's a good time to let you know that we have a project website if you haven't seen it already. Um, I will also put that in the chat for you. It is boston.gov slash Crawford Walnut. And we're gonna be updating that website throughout the project. So I, again, I'll put that link for you guys um, in just a few minutes. Also wanted to um, thank everybody who can make the meeting tonight. It's nice to see um, a couple of familiar faces that I know from either this uh, meeting previously or other meetings in the neighborhood. Um, if you have any friends or neighbors who weren't able to make it tonight, um, please share what you learned tonight and also make sure that people know about the project website because they'll be able to see the recording of the meeting there. Next slide, please. Um, we wanna make sure that the conversation feels accessible to everybody. So please feel free to join in, um, but let's try to also be respectful and keep our um, ourselves muted when we're not speaking, just to make it a little easier for everybody to hear. Um, you can also use your chat throughout the um, presentation if you uh, have any questions as well. And just to make sure everybody knows, the reason we're here tonight is to make sure we hear the community feedback. Um, and we want to let you know that we're going to just have a short presentation and then open it to discussion at the end. Um, and like I was saying a little earlier, um, if you have something that pops into your head um, during the presentation, feel free to put that into the chat and we can, we can get to it during the discussion time. And hopefully that takes care of all of the housekeeping stuff. Um, so now on to the agenda. Um, want to thank you guys all again for your time. I know it's really hard to take time out for these meetings. Um, I personally have four this week, so I totally get how hard it is for everybody to be here. Um, we're going to do a quick introduction of the team and a really quick overview of the first meeting for people who maybe couldn't um, join us for that. And then we're going to go into the presentation tonight. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that's going to work. Um, and then again, we'll have discussions throughout the presentation. So the intro slide. So for our, um, there we go, for our team. Um, for those of you who may have joined a little late, my name is Lauren Bryant and I'm the project manager for Boston Parks for Crawford and Walnut Parks. Um, Christine Brandeo, our outreach coordinator from Boston Parks wasn't able to join us tonight but she's a really great resource and her contact information is on the project team slide if you need anything from her. Also gonna introduce our design team from CBA Landscape Architects and maybe each of them could give a little wave when I say their names and then they can introduce themselves as they do their portion of the presentation. We've got Megan Tompkins, Jessica Choi and Jocelyn Wolf with us tonight. Our project overview. Um, so, like I said, tonight we're going to be talking about both Crawford Street Playground and Walnut Park. And for those of you who weren't at our first meeting, this is not our standard to talk about two parks at one time. Um, but because of the fact that these parks are so close to each other and on the same street, we want to make sure that we're thinking about them both holistically as we um, move forward with the design so that we, we make sure that we're meeting the needs of both of the parks, but we're also not duplicating anything as well. Um, so as we move through the presentation tonight, we're going to, like I said, do that brief overview, and then we're going to talk about some design alternatives for Walnut first, and so that none of the ideas and the thoughts that you guys have about that um, get lost while we're then talking about Crawford. We'll take a break to have a discussion about Walnut for five to 10 minutes, 
And then we will do the same for Crawford and have a discussion about Crawford. Um, and then obviously we'll open it up at the end and we can talk and compare both of them, but we just wanna be able to have people have a chance to give us their feedback while each park is fresh in their minds. Next slide, please. So like I said earlier, this is our second meeting for this project. The first meeting we held in June of this year, and we had a lot of really great feedback from the community um, about things they like at each of the parks, things that um, they'd like to change at each of the parks, things they'd like upgraded or added. So that was really wonderful feedback. And tonight, the design team is going to show you two concepts that they created for each of the parks based on all of that feedback that we got. Um, and these aren't necessarily a choice between two designs. It's really a way of us showing you um, different alternatives for what can happen within the park. And it may be that what we end up with is sort of a mix of multiple different ideas from each of these concepts. So don't feel like when we get there, you have to choose A or B. This is really to bring about discussion and to give people something to look at, to give feedback to. Um, we're currently planning on holding the third, which will be the final community meeting in mid-September. And we're pushing that back a little bit from what we talked about at the last meeting, mainly because we wanna make sure that when we're talking about the final design, that all the kids are back in school and we can really get the Ellis community involved um, a bit more once they're back as well. Um, so then we, after that, we will finalize the design after that last meeting and we'll put together our construction documents and plan to bid the project over the winter with um, still talking about a spring construction start next year. Um, and, you know, probably a fall to winter opening of the park um, and an estimated construction cost of $1.9 million between the two projects. Um, and so with that, I'll stop talking about um, all the nitty gritty stuff for the project and turn it over to Megan to start the presentation. All right. Hi. Hi. Is there a um, echo? Okay, good. Sorry. I heard it for a second. Zoom is so much fun. Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to run through some the sort of project site context and the site analysis that we did for the first meeting really quickly, just as a refresher. Um, I'm going to try to go quickly because I assume that if you're at this meeting, you are familiar with one or both of the parks already. So I probably don't need to tell you too much about your own parks. Um, we always like to show a slide that shows the um, parks in uh, neighborhood context. So to just see what other um, both green space amenities and you know things like schools, um, libraries, et cetera, are nearby. Um, the yellow line is a quarter mile radius. The, or the interior yellow line is a quarter mile. The bigger one is a half mile. Um, and um, as I think Lauren has noted, and we all kind of know, Crawford Playground and, Wal and Walnut are very close together on Walnut Ave. Um, just a quick site context showing all the streets and sort of different traffic pattern um, around these two parks. Um, we did some site analysis for meeting one. Um, this slide just shows the two parks in relationship to each other. They're very close together, a walking distance of about 275 feet. Um, and the other thing that I like to note in early on talking about these two parks is that the each park has a playground, but the playground at Crawford is about is, is less than half of the size of the Walnut one. So Crawford being near the school is a much smaller playground. Just this sort of a something to think about. Um, and uh, existing conditions planned for Walnut. Um, this is where I like to talk about sort of how we talk about playgrounds. So we often label them as these two age groups, five to 12 and two to five. Um, this has to do with sort of playground structure industry standards. So that's how these structures are designed. Um, for safety for those different age groups. So if, if we reference those age groups, um, we're just talking about sort of industry standards and, you know, we usually like to have both to, you know, meet all the age, age range needs. So anyway, Walnut has structures for both and a big splash pad. 
and swings. And then moving on to Crawford, it's a much more complicated play or park um, with both the playground, a bunch of open lawn space and the um, little league field, which can also accommodate, I believe, softball and soccer and a bunch of um, entry and exit points into the park. Um, and this is the other sort of point that I like to make early on talking about Crawford is um, accessibility is a, is a big thing we've been thinking about um, regard, in, regarding this park. So accessibility, um, you know, has to do with sort of ADA standards. Um, and as you can see here, the, you know, it has to do with like the slope on site. Um, and whether you need a ramp or stairs, and you know, stairs are not accessible in the way a ramp, are, a ramp is. So um, the blue dash lines are generally at an existing sort of uh, accessible pitch. The ones that are orange um, are non-compliant. So, and as you can see, there's quite a few. Um, so this is a thing that we, we wanna make this whole park accessible for everyone. Um, so that's one of the big sort of design points that we've been working with. Right. Um, and I did want to briefly recap um, notes that we have that we took from the first community meeting. So I'll start with Walnut. Um, there was generally sort of less feedback on this one. I think it's a simpler park, so that makes sense. Um, folks wanted to keep the splash pad swings, both play structures. Um, there was a comment about um, creating a little more privacy from Walnut Street and also about upgrading site lighting. And then the notes for the for Crawford from the few, first community meeting were a little more extensive. Um, some of them were sort of in, in relationship to Walnut. Um, you know, folks wanted to see, you know, a, a bigger place, a bigger playground here. Um, maybe more things like, like what are at Wal Walnut, so swings um, and the addition of a splash pad, which would be a, a big new feature. Um, other things like, I think a big one was a suggestion to create a space where people can feel connected to both the ball fields and the playground. Um, so trying to tie both parts of the park together. Um, and then some, uh, you know, other things that same thing with site lighting, um, maybe adding spectator seating for the, um, for the ball fields. There was a, there was a lot of support for this idea of a, a walking loop in the park. Um, we looked at it a lot and we believe that, so the current space for the ball field is, um, undersized for like a minimum um, little League outfield. So the outfield is already undersized. Um, adding a walking loop to that area would encroach on that in a way that doesn't seem safe for walkers. Um, so we have not actually added that to these to our preliminary design plans. Um, you know, and then there were a few other great comments like, you know, tying into site history or neighborhood history. All right. And at this point, um, I am going to pass, um, pass the presentation over to Jocelyn Wolf from CBA, and she is going to walk us through our um, initial schematic design plans for Walnut. Hi, everyone. I'm Jocelyn. I think I said I'll be going over our two um, schematic plans for Walnut this evening. Um, slide, please. <laughs> so um, this is our first option. In this option, um, we have kind of two main ideas um, that focused the park design, um, one of which was to recess and combine all the play features into one cohesive area. Um, and the other one was kind of restructuring the entrances to redefine corners and also connections to Crawford. So um, we maintain two of the entrances. Currently, there's a seating plaza that's more outer facing towards the road and isn't within the park fence limits. So we got rid of that and gained a little bit of space uh, to create a vegetative buffer on that corner, um, just to kind of create a little bit of uh, privacy from that busy intersection. 
Um, and then also in removing that entrance on the Walnut Avenue, we um, were hoping to um, reinforce the idea that the other entrance that we're maintaining is a larger prominent entrance, um, especially because of its proximity to Crawford. And the way you get to Crawford Park uh, Playground is on the crosswalk walk that's behind some of those labels. Um, and then we also create a little bit of seating um, along that path to create a little bit more of a buffer between uh, Walnut Avenue and the play uh, features. So like I said, we push the play features to the side to create a little bit more of that buffer and that privacy um, and nestle the pages two to five play structure kind of the northwestern um, corner. Um, and then raise the five to 12 structure up a little bit on the site. Um, and then in between those two features, we added a feature that can be used by both age groups, um, which is a two to 12 year old spinner. And oftentimes, and I'll show you pressing this picture in the next image, um, next slide, but you can even fit a bunch of kids on there. And it's really fun and interactive. Um, and then we pulled the swings down and introduced two net swings or dish swings for the ages of five to 12, which again are kind of a more interactive play experience. Um, and then in this inter in this option, we created this central um, splash pad and um, created some seating around it to kind of create a focal point. So for this splash pad, we introduced some more sculptural play features, splash pad features, which aren't currently on site. Currently, it's more of a flushed uh, splash pad. Um, so just kind of looking at different types of play, we can introduce in this site or in Crawford if you guys like it. Um, and then surrounding this central splash pad, we have some seat walls um, so that caregivers can either kind of internally reflect and watch their grandkids or kids play the splash pad or sit the other direction and face out to the park. Um, we also added a couple of shade trees to the interior of the site to create a little bit more shade for those kids playing um, and just a little bit more comfort because the site because currently there's no shade on the, very little shade on the uh, inside. Um, and then buffering the whole park with some nice understory um, trees and flowering trees and kind of those gaps that are existing. And for both options, we are maintaining all of the existing trees, unless there's some issue with them later on that an arborist says that we need to remove them, but no trees are being removed. Um, and we're also introducing a couple nice pedestrian scale lighting features, scratch receptacles, um, and gates to all of this um, for this option and the next option. Um, next, please, Megan. So for this option, we are looking at a different type of play structure. Um, for the other options, we show more kind of post and platform. This one's kind of a more climbing rope feature for both age groups. Um, and so like you can see the first image on the upper left-hand corner is a two to five structure. The bottom right hand is a five to 12. So lots of kids can fit on these things. And there are different types of play that you can use and you can slide off them, which is pretty fun. And then um, the other two images are the dish swing I talked about and the spinning feature that we could have uh, between the two play features. Next, please. And then these are some pictures of just some furniture presents that we thought about while designing. Um, some contemporary nice seating options, um, whether it's a back bench, um, picnic table, or card or game table for different types of seating within the site. Um, and this, the upper right hand image shows kind of what a seat wall could look like. These wouldn't be planted, so you'd be able to switch that. To, you can sit both directions and face out or in um, some more dynamic, uh, diverse types of seating. And then lastly, uh, the last image at the bottom left is that sculptural spray uh, speed features that I talked about. Um, and this kind of how they're fun and it's a different type of splash pad that currently exists that we can explore in this option or in Crawford. Next, please. So this is um, SMAP plan option B. Um, for this one, we looked at maintaining um, the features kind of where they already are, but by removing that um, seating plaza that looks out uh, over the intersection, we could gain a little bit more space and kind of create more dynamic ways of play within the site. So just adding more features. So everything is pretty much where it is. Um, but we removed one of the entrances on, or the only entrance on Crawford, or sorry, Walnut Park, and created two entrances on Walnut Avenue and kind of made a C shape that aligns better to Wal Walnut Avenue um, to kind of create a nice movement throughout the site. 
Um, and we kept the two to five where it was, um, made it a little bit bigger and updated that structure. We um, kept the five to 12 structure where it was in that corner, um, but made it a little bit larger. So we could introduce a five to 12 year old center, so a new type of play. Um, and then in both areas, we added a back bench recess, um, kind of or with an already existing shade trees. So they are already kind of protected from that sun. Um, and then lastly, we introduced a new feature, which is uh, ages like three to 12, it's about three to 12 obstacle course play, which is kind of more natural, imaginative play that both kids can kind of get together um, and play on. We kept the splash pad where it was. Um, but we just updated and made it a little bit more contemporary with more rectilinear seat walls and shape to it. Um, this one maintained flush sprays, but again, we could, do, we could explore something else, but having flush, you can use it for other uses too. Um, we surrounded the spray pad, um, the spray pad with some understory or flowering trees to create a little bit more privacy, um, which was a concern raised in the first meeting specifically around the splash pad. Um, and then we kept the swings where they were, but added a dish swing. So we still have a two to five uh, swing set, a dish swing, and then an ADA swing as well as a two to five swing. And then all within this, we were able to add kind of a centralized pergola with um, like a shade structure with backless benches. So you can have more um, versatile sitting options. Um, and then also some picnic tables. And then surrounding the entire site, we have some more shade trees to just fill in some of these gaps um, that these existing trees have left so to create a little bit more privacy as well as shade on the site. Uh, next is. So these are the play features that we um, show. Uh, as you can see, the five to 12 is actually quite large. It's a I think it's a little bit larger than the existing. It's a fun, more post and um, platform type structure and the spinner as well as the one that we showed. Um, and just a fun kind of updated version of that site um, with existing conditions. Uh, the image to the right is um, just diverse um, days of swings with different types of swings. And below that is the two to five, um, which shows it can kind of be cohesive with the other existing structure and have a fun music motif play aspect to it. And then lastly, the image on the bottom left-hand corner is that natural obstacle course-like play that lots of kids of different ages can get on and use in different ways. Um, next please. Um, and then th these are just some options for um, furnishings on this site. We showed a red pergola. It does not have to be red, but we thought it'd be fun to show um, an option with a bright color. We're going to be showing a, a pergola on um, for Crawford as well. That's a little bit more of a subtle color, but just as a fun aspect, we can introduce some kind of color. It'd be a fun way to introduce color to this site. Um, it's also a contemporary metal uh, shade structure. Uh, the image to the right shows kind of the flush uh, splash pad with motifs we could explore, um, but also kind of that versatility of it doesn't always have to be a splash pad. Um, it can be used for other things, not just for spray and cooling down in the summer. And then lastly, we just showed a couple of different options for furniture, one more contemporary, one more kind of classic park, um, but also with potential game uh, features of the, of the tables. Next, please. And this last slide um, for Walnut is just showing some existing features that we want to maintain and maybe just um, refurbish a little bit. Uh, we found out last meeting that this amazing decorative fence uh, was made from handprints from kids from the David Ellis School. So we really want to maintain this um, and create, uh, maintain that, you know, history within the site to the neighborhood and its residents. So we want to take this and refurbish it. Um, and then also there is an existing uh, concrete wall along the side with the swing set. And it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not very dynamic now. There's a little bit of um, ebbs and flows to it and kind of dimension, but it'd be really fun to play off of that with some colors and just liven it up a bit. So these are just options that we were thinking about exploring and both options. I think that's it. So we know that's a lot to take in. So before we jump into talking about the same kinds of things for Crawford, we just wanted to take a minute to see if anybody has any thoughts about these or any comments about things they liked, things that stood out in each of the different um, each of the different options to you guys. 
Hi. Um, Hi. My name's my name's Tamara Lawrence. I live on Townsend Street, and okay. I'm part of Garrison Trotter. And I love this because it's much needed, and especially for all the kids. And I was a Boston public school teacher, but I think it would be nice if um, the, it's another play space for the um, Ellis mm -hmm. to utilize. Um, I'm wondering around the perimeter, because I see this at other parks, around the perimeter of the park is maybe putting a walking path. So, um, you know, it could be colorful around if you want to incorporate like the alphabet or numbers so that as kids, if someone was going to utilize it, they could um, just walk around the perimeter of the park or parents could. And it's also a learning tool. And my mm -hmm. one last question is who is gonna maintain the park? Cause that's part of my biggest issue is the park isn't always maintained. And um, so thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. And I think all of those are really good comments. And I know that um, we had talked about walking loops at Crawford, and I don't think that we had really thought about those in terms of Walnut. So we'll take a look and see if we can incorporate that into some of the designs as we move forward. Um, and to answer the question about maintenance, it would be Boston Parks. And if there's ever anything that is not maintained um, the way you feel it should be, um, please feel free to call 311 because all of those comments are tracked and go to the department. So if there are things that aren't being done, um, you guys see the park a lot more than we do, um, especially more than I do. And I know our maintenance guys are there, um, but they also have an entire region and full transparency are completely understaffed. Um, and so if there are things, please let us know because there are just sometimes we don't see those things. Um, so that would be, that's a good way to, to help get that information into the hands of people who can make those changes. Um, and I love the idea um, of graphics on the surfacing. And I know it's something um, that the design team CBA does really well is sort of some of that theming and especially some of the educational things. They've done a lot of fun stuff. And I know, Megan, I don't know if you guys could jump back to a couple of the things that um, I think it was Paris Street, maybe a picture from the water play. Um, yeah. So here they had, um, it's a little hard to tell in this, but the water play, the circular pattern is actually the solar system. Um, and so they've done a lot of that kind of thing. You guys did some stuff with fruits and vegetables somewhere. Um, I can't in remember Brighton. which part that is. Yeah. Um, but so that's one of the things these guys are particularly good at. So it's good to know that that's something you're interested in. Definitely. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, if you have ideas for, for theming or for, you know, any, anything like that to incorporate into this park, we would love, we would love it. Um, that's fun for us. And I, one of the things that I know we didn't mention, um, I know it was mentioned at the first meeting, but also sort of ties into maintenance is that um, I know BPRD standard for, um, for playground surfacing going forward is the poured in place rubber. I know this park is currently the wood chips and I know those are, they don't, they don't stay put and they're, you know, they don't stay as safe as they should be and they collect trash and, and that we would be doing the poured in place rubber, you know, soft surfacing for this renovation. Hazel, if, if you're talking, you're muted. I see. I see. Well, I'm sorry. Oh, good. Okay. Sorry. I, well, I just wanted to make sure we heard you. What would be the material of the uh, one of the um, splash pads? I saw some poles. What would that those be? What material would those be? So, good question. Am I, am I still? Okay, good. Sorry. I couldn't tell if I kept myself unmuted. Um, splash pads that we do are often um, bituminous concrete and a lot of times we do um, painted graphics on top. I believe this one is so like asphalt road surface but it's a little nicer with the paint. Um, we typically do not do those in I think this is probably what you're quite what you're asking about. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I think that is the same that's either concrete or um, bituminous concrete which is like road surfacing but painted. 
And you can see in the this front right here, that's a, um, the rubber of the adjacent playground. We usually don't do these in rubber because the rubber doesn't hold up as well for a splash pad. And, um, those we, poles for them. The poles, poles, yeah. Like, so those, we could get your guys' take on that. So a lot of times with um, water play, we have um, like the one that we showed that had the solar system that just has jets that are flush in the ground and shoot up. Um, but there are also some products like these, which are like a metal. So they're like the same materials, like a post on a playground or like the post on a swing um, that can squirt out the top. So we could do things like that, but there's also, you know, a combination of them that we could do. Um, the other thing is sometimes we, um, with the surfacing, we've been looking a lot lately at doing the surfacing of the water play with concrete because it's a lot cooler than the asphalt. Um, so that's probably the direction that we would lean for the surface here too. I am curious since we're talking about the water play, um, do you, in, because we're talking about water play at both, we could have one um, park that has one type of water play, one park that has another. Does anybody have any thoughts on the water play at Walnut and what might be better? Something that has, you know, some playful elements that stand up or something that's more flush? I like the flush idea. I would agree because since other people use the park, um, mm -hmm. I just get concerned particularly about, you know, late night activities and people swinging and hanging and damaging and the flush mm -hmm. ones are less likely, but maybe if the flush ones could have um, different um, mm -hmm. levels like they do yeah. at the casinos and stuff and go in different directions or even having a spinning um, water feature. So when it comes out, it spins like a, uh, what is that? Like the slip in, like the, there used to be yeah. a water thing that used to just spin back and forth. So. <laughs> so sometimes the spinning ones, when they have the movable parts, those are the ones that can sometimes get damaged easily, but we can mm -hmm. definitely do things where there are some that go straight up, some that go at angles. There are even some that come out that are um, almost like little water tunnels that kids can try to run under. Um, so there yeah. are a lot of different options that we could, at the next meeting, we could bring some, some examples of what each of those kinds of nozzles do to change it and get everybody's feedback on the ones they think are the most fun too. Okay. What about before we um, before we jump over to Crawford? I'm curious what people's take is on the different types of play equipment here, because with all of those, the orientation of each of the each of the layouts, any of the equipment could be used um, with either option. So I'm just curious if anybody has any strong opinions or things they like a lot of, you know, any of these pictures that we're showing now? No, I'm open. I, I love the net. I just get worried about kids getting caught in the net. Okay. Um, but a lot of people sleep in the park. Not a lot. I won't say that. I'm not saying that. But periodically okay. when I walk in the morning, people will sleep on the benches. And so, but I don't think we should not put something this cool in the park for the kids because there's a possibility that someone would be sleeping on it. Because regardless of what's there, if someone it needs a space to lay, they're place. gonna lay. Right. But I, I mean, I'm all about slides, climbing, anything climbing. Um, and again, that net is really cool, swings, things like that. Um, is there, can we look at the option B, play equipment while we're talking about it? Between these ones, is there anything that, you know, any of the kind of bigger kid structures or the little kid structures that you think are more fun than the other or um, some of the things we've talked about are, you know, more traditional, that was my timer for our discussion, um, any more like thoughts on the swings in terms of traditional kind of belt swings versus the dish swings that you can get a lot of kids on at once in terms of kids really interacting with each other? It'd be nice mm -hmm. to have a com combination of the, uh, the mm -hmm. you know, the dish swing and the uh, single swings. Mm -hmm. yes. Nice, because yes. some kids come by themselves, some kids come with kids. So it's better if you have a combination. Okay. And that yes. cello thing is nice. What is that called that uh, 
saucer thing? Is that a um? Oh, it looks oh. like a seesaw. Like a, 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 it goes around. It and like around. it wobbles, and yeah. it's actually um, accessible, and kids in wheelchairs can use it as well, which is really oh, neat. I love that. Yeah. I forget what that one's called, Megan. Do you remember? Wait, this the the, the sway fun or something? Is that what the, that's yeah. called? I don't think that's the sway fun. We're talking about this little thing that oh, looks like a not, turtle, okay. right? No, the thing in the upper left picture. Like a bowl. Um, yeah. Yes. I sorry, I don't remember the exact name of that one. But okay. yeah, that's a that's a nice one for for accessibility for sure. So then the other um, the other thing just out of curiosity's sake is sort of the layout of the park. And I don't know, Megan, if we could sort of jump back and forth between those two options and just mm -hmm. So this one really separates each of the areas. So you have a younger kids area, an older kids area, and the swing sort of separated, um, but they're obviously close enough. Everyone can kind of play between them. And then the other option, um, the other option sort of has all of the play in one zone with the pathway kind of going around it. And I'm curious what people think about sort of separated play spaces versus having them all together. As a person who has a two-year-old niece and who's gone to the park where other big kids are there, it, it is nice to have a space that as kids are running around, like they won't go into that. I do like, so I should just say, I like the idea of separated okay. play spaces for the little ones. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, I could be open to. I agree because I see sometimes younger kids go to the playground and they see these big giant kids. It looks like giants to them and they're running. <laughs> that kind of dates them to want to play. So if they have a little space where they know, you know, things are going to move a little slower, then I think mm -hmm. that's better for them and for the parents. Because when you take a young child to the playground and you have 10 year olds running, you know, you're kind of afraid for your. Mm -hmm two-year-old so. absolutely believe me as a parent of an 11 year old I get worried when he's running around at the playground because of the little one so I get it it works on the other end too yeah. Yeah. um so one other quick question before we jump into talking about Crawford is um, one of these options showed a shade structure and we don't know what that design would look like yet um but what do you guys think about a, a shade structure is that something that um you think people would use it's not a solid top so it wouldn't um, help with rain but it definitely would provide some additional shade in the summer um, and knowing that Roxbury is definitely a heat island in terms of climate change we're trying to think about oh. these things um, so I'm curious if people like that idea do you think people would use it oh I think people would definitely use it especially okay. if it has um, uh, picnic tables under it um, exactly. for parties I mean I could see people staking out their claim for a birthday party. Um, and, you know, things. I like it. I like the color yellow, but I do love red, but I love bright colors. So I'm kind well, of we'll, we'll take note of that. Um, <laughs> anything else from anybody before we jump into Crawford? We can always come back, but I just don't want to cut anybody off. The only question I had was, is there a way to put another exit or entrance on the street that is adjacent to Walnut. So- The um, Walnut Park, that yeah. lower one? Yeah, Walnut, yeah, Walnut Park, okay. right. I think we can definitely take Even a look at that. Even if there's a single gate, it, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll take a look at that. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll let you know next time um, how we can sort of get all of those things in there. Okay. Wonderful. Jessica, Great. are you ready to jump into Crawford? Yep. Awesome. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Jessica, and I'm going to go through 
um, two schematic options for Crawford Playground. Um, so basically for option A, um, we mainly looked at keeping the ball field and the playground area um, pretty much where they are and focusing more on how we can expand the playground area and just kind of improve um, the surrounding spaces around the ball field. Um, and as Megan mentioned, accessibility um, was one of the biggest challenges of the site, given that it's like um, very much like a hillside. Um, so the pathway system that we uh, are proposing here is fully ADA accessible, um, but this one specifically, we tried to um, rely mostly on a combination of um, ramps and sloped walkways and try to keep um, like the number of steps to a minimum. Um, so I guess I'll start on the Crawford Street side, which, as you all know, is um, the lower side of the park. Um, as you see, the playground stays along the Crawford Street edge, um, but we look at really pushing it and expanding it to the north side of the park, kind of sort of on the museum side. Um, and basically, since since the site is so big, I think I'm going to focus more on like the organization of the spaces and just kind of how you you move uh, between the different zones. Um, so at the playground, you enter at the same entry um, along Crawford Street, and then from there you kind of take a left and can take that middle path up um, uh, that basically looks like it kind of divides um, the playground into two distinct zones, um, kind of like what um, we did for uh, Walnut Option B, um, creating those distinct zones um, for different age groups. Um, and on the other side of that middle path, um, it takes you to a more defined entry plaza um, that uh, we've also included um, a splash pad feature, which is completely new to the park. And um, at that, um, portion. It, it's a little higher than the playground area. So this area kind of also serves as a, a nice place to kind of view down into the play space. Um, so again, this middle path um, basically divides um, the playground into two sides. Um, the, the side to the right um, can be designated for older kids ages 5 to 12. Um, and the the left side um, can be designated for younger kids ages um, two to five. Um, and as you can see, we um, are basically trying to show that we can fit a much larger structure for each and, and can also begin to incorporate um, a lot more different kinds of play elements um, as well. Um, so yeah, so you, you can go up that path, get to that splash pad, and from the splash pad, um, you can either um, go back down the slope path or there's that upper path along um, the existing hillside lawn that can take you back to this um, this main um, path up towards the hill that's consisted of um, a series of ramps. Um, before we get to the sports field side, I just want to point out um, on the other side of the Crawford Street entry, we've also tried to include um, some bike racks and an exercise station um, so that the play area and the exercise can kind of feel like um, its own space. So moving up along um, that ramped walkway, again, we try to um, maintain much of the existing hillside lawn. Um, and then as you get up to that point, um, kind of like at that intersection um, right um, in front of uh, the backstop. Um, we also have a ramped walkway that is a direct connection back to the school. Um, and to kind of give you a sense of like how the topography is working so far. So we've kept the ball field where it is, which is pretty much on like the highest point of the site. Um, so if you're standing kind of at that landing, um, that's at the intersection between those ramped walkways, um, you're sort of standing a couple feet below the ball field. Um, but I think that change in level also kind of allows the sports field area sort of uh, feel like its own distinct um, zone or kind of like on its own terrace. Um, so from that landing, basically to get to um, an area that's level with the field, um, you basically move up that sloped walk, um, kind of moving south along uh, the ball field. And at that intersection of those three um, existing paths, uh, we really try to create um, a much more generous seating area um, to provide for spectators as they're watching the games. Um, so those like three um, grayish uh, rectangular uh, shapes are basically um, bleacher seating that we've included. Maybe two of them could also have like a shade structure on top. Um, behind that area, we've um, those kind of triangular shaped spaces could be a more defined seating plaza with different types of um, uh, 
seating furniture, like picnic tables or game tables, just basically kind of trying to really activate that site or that side of the park, um, just for, you know, the whole community to enjoy. Um, and at the ball field, um, on either side of the ball field, we've um, wanted to keep some type of team bench seating, but also add um, some type of shelter over. And, um, and as May Megan mentioned earlier, um, the existing ball field, um, basically that dashed line, um, as you see, it extends beyond the edges of the park. And that's about 200 feet from um, the home plate, which is like the minimum um, distance um, required for either softball or little league. So um, because of that, we decided to omit um, a possible perimeter path on this side of the park. Um, so those three remaining paths um, that connect to those other access points, um, the priority was to make them all completely accessible. Um, so from the Crawford Street side, that was achieved through a series of ramps that take you up to the seating area. Um, from the Abbotsford Street side, um, just a simple sloped walk. And then on the Walnut Street entry, um, those are it, currently there are those steps. So we decided to replace them um, and with a sloped walk into the field, um, which actually it's gonna end up having to cut into the field to get up to um, the elevation of the field. Um, so unfortunately along that path, we might have to lose um, all those existing trees, um, but wherever possible, we did try to replace them with new ones um, and wherever it made sense to add some you know, shade and comfort around new seating areas, we've also added um, trees as well. So that's option A. Um, next slide, please. Um, so these are um, the types of uh, play experiences and styles of structures that we're thinking for this option. Um, again, we can totally mix and match between the two other options. Um, but basically, um, the lower left corner image is um, an example of a really large um, structure for older kids, ages five to 12. Um, so it's really packed with all kinds of different play elements and components. Um, and specifically, um, it has like a really tall tower element that I think could be a nice way of sort of anchoring um, the playground area, especially since it's kind of like on a lower part of the site. Um, and then for the two to five play area, which is the image um, on the upper right, um, we're also thinking of having some fun, um, maybe including some kind of fun and larger contemporary structure for the younger kids as well. And then the other images, so the one on the top left um, is an example of uh, maybe something smaller for um, smaller group play experiences um, like that climbing spinner um, and then uh, maybe tucked into even tighter spaces, we could also think about including some more individual episodic um, or sensory play elements like the musical instrument um, on the lower right side. Next slide. Um, so for athletic features, obviously keeping the ball field um, for um, ball games and um, soccer or um, any kind of free play um, and the exercise equipment that we're showing um, specifically um, is uh, it basically has multiple stations in one structure. Next slide. Um, and then for furnishings, again, we really tried to focus a lot of the seating um, near the spectator area. So um, we want to make sure we include some type of bleacher seating, um, a shelter over um, the team benches, um, and here we're also showing some typical park benches that could maybe have like a fun pop of color or, or they could even be a little more contemporary as shown with these picnic benches that could also be just as bright, um, which we think would be kind of cool to have um, at a park um, this big. Next slide. Okay, and then for option B, um, so Really the driving force for this design or the main focus um, was trying to create a much um, stronger visual connection um, between the two major areas. So between the ball field and the play area. Um, and so we were really trying to develop that space in between. So kind of like at the intersection of those of the two sides of the park. And what ended up resulting is this plaza or this overlook area. Um, Yep, and uh, basically we um, try to make really make that kind of that 
um, like a node area or a point where all um, the major areas kind of meet. Um, all the paths would kind of converge at this point and it sort of becomes like a nice destination point um, at this site. And also kind of like a transitioning point between like the lower level um, play area and the upper um, sports field area. So as you can see, um, it's connected by all these paths um, with a direct connection back to the school. Within this Overlook Plaza, we've um, wanted to you know, make it feel um, more activated with some kind of um, flush splash pad feature, um, as well as with some seating and possibly a pergola or shade structure. Um, and um, I guess I'll move to the playground side where um, in addition to further reinforce that visual um, connection across all the different programmatic elements, we looked at um, moving the playground away from the Crawford Street edge, um, keeping a lot of those existing trees um, along the Crawford Street side and um, seeing what would happen if it if the play kind of just sort of nestles into the hillside. Um, so as you'll see in the next uh, precedent image slide, um, you'll kind of get a sense of sort of that hillside experience that ends up resulting in this kind of um, play area. And so basically the way you would move around or the accessible way to get around the play, the playground side would be to again, start from the Crawford Street entry where we've also added some bike racks. Um, you would move up the sloped walk, take a right and kind of follow this loop around. Um, there's two little gate entries in the middle of the play area. Um, unlike option A where there is a uh, distinct, um, there's definitely a clear um, separation between the two age groups. Um, there's more, um, the play structures for both age groups are pretty much in a shared space, but, you know, we can look at a more subtle division with, you know, an existing tree and some um, treatment with the graphics. Um, but basically, that's one of the major differences between um, this option and the previous one. Um, so basically, again, the path loops around, you can go around the playground, um, or you can go further out and there's um, an even wider loop around um, that takes you back up to that um, overlook plaza. And hopefully those kind of loop paths will make up for not having a loop path on the field side. Um, and then the main, I guess, more direct path up towards the plaza is an unaccessible um, way, but a faster route um, consisting of steps and sloped walks. Um, and then we're back at the plaza area um, and to the sports field. And so, and similarly for the sports field, we also looked at shifting that over a little inward, um, a little to the east and also rotating it slightly to kind of miss that really big tree at the intersection of those paths. Um, and again, it's unfortunately, it's still, um, the site is still a little too small to fit a full outfield, but this at least opens up some opportunities to include some seating um, along the north side of the field. Um, and maybe some of that seating could become seat walls built in the, into the hillside. And maybe that could also be the same language used for the team benching, um, where we've also included um, some kind of shade structure or shelter for the team players as well. And pretty much uh, mirroring that uh, seating area on the other side of the field as well. Um, and then behind the spectator seating, um, this is where we ended up putting the exercise station and some additional bike racks. Um, so more associated with the sports field side versus um, the playground area. And just like an option A, um, those three paths that connect to those three other access points. There weren't too many options that we could play with here, but just as long as, you know, we've provided um, a fully ADA accessible path um, way into the park. Um, so for from Crawford Street, again, a series of ramps takes you up. This one's a little bit more wiggly, just maybe to create a more meandering experience. Um, and then the other two entries from Abbotsford and Walnut, um, again, we're uh, creating a, a sloped walk into the park. Um, I think, I think that's it for this one. Next. Um, so for play features, um, so basically in terms of style, we were thinking um, maybe going with something more traditional, like a post and platform sort of structure. Um, the image to the right is probably maybe a more contemporary take on that type. Um, but this image in particular, we wanted to show to kind of give you a sense of how a structure like that could be integrated into 
um, like a, a hillside experience. And so as you see, um, there's a series of steps that kind of take you up to like a higher elevation and you enter the structure like over this bridge and that's how you get into this play area and then from there you can eventually climb your way down or slide your way down to a lower level and that's essentially kind of what's happening um, in option b um, so that's just kind of give you an idea of what's possible with a more um, i guess full structure like that and we can definitely look at doing something similar for um, a younger age group um, the image to the left is um, kind of a more traditional post and platform um, type structure for ages two to five and then the lower images are more um, kind of more episodic um, elements that can be strategically placed along the hillside um, to again kind of really you know amplify that hillside experience um, and, and make the hill itself be become part of the play. Um, so we can look at embankment slides, um, different types of slides, uh, some type of climber. Um, these rubber spheres um, could be integrated into the hillside and, and even just like running up and down the hill could be totally fun. Um, next slide. Um, and then for athletic features, again, pretty much the same, keeping the sports field um, for the exercise stations, a little different instead of just, you know, one um, combined structure, just sort of separating them out into these individual little stations. Um, next slide. Um, and then for furnishings, um, so there are two images here showing um, seat walls um, and, and basically given the site, you know, with all its topography, inevitably we're going, we're going to have to retain, you know, some part of the site at some point. Um, and so for this option, we thought it would be nice wherever possible to have those retaining walls also serve as seat walls. Um, and so, you know, they could be curving, um, they could be straight. Um, the image to the right um, is actually lining a sloped walkway, which is um, kind of what's happening um, or what we're showing at that Overlook Plaza area. And it sort of creates this amphitheater experience um, as you're looking down um, into the play area. Um, and then we're also showing a pergola image um, uh, to kind of reference back to, you know, having some kind of nice shade structure at that overlook plaza. And then maybe under that and throughout the site, um, we can show um, some type of like cafe or picnic table seating for, for small gatherings or, or big gatherings. Next slide. And then finally, we wanted to show um, this slide um, for just Crawford Playground in general, um, just because, you know, it's such a big site and there's so many different access points. Um, and so we really just want to make sure um, the entries um, are definitely, you know, very visible and easy to find and, and also to just kind of really, um, you know, give the site, you know, a stronger sense of identity in a way. Um, and maybe, you know, some of that language could be carried to the Walnut Street Playground. Um, so, you know, we can look at archways or, um, you know, entry markers or columns um, or similar to what we did in option A, kind of just um, expanding the entry into like an open plaza area. Um, and then finally, the, the image on the lower left um, is just some interpretive signage that we can think about integrating, um, especially in response to that comment about, you know, wanting to tie into, you know, the neighborhood history and um, the Abbotsford estate and just, you know, really uh, being a great educational opportunity for the neighborhood and, and for the school. So I think that's it. So once again, that was a lot of information um, and a lot of different options. So we can jump back and forth between any of the pictures. Um, but I'd be curious if, um, you know, just sort of starting out big picture, if anybody has any thoughts about sort of the orientation of some of the items where we have, you know, like the plaza that connects the two, the field and the playground versus um, versus not um, something like that or things like exercise equipment associated with the field versus exercise equipment associated with the playground. Um, because those could those could happen either way in any of the options. So I'm just kind of curious from like an overall site layout if people have any thoughts. I have a question. Um, yeah. Is it possible to, are the, the ramps going to be, have any type of lighting feature, whether it's like 
like solar disk in the floors or something, you know, in case, you know, as dusk falls, you know, it's a way to see that if there's any lighting, that's one. And then two, on the Walnut Street side is there's that retaining wall. And I know you have the uh, ramp going up that over into the ball field. I mean, that retaining wall is a little funky anyway, and there's rats that live in there because um, you get to see them in the morning. And I'm wondering, is, is there something a little more, something that's a better option for the retain, because I know you need the retaining wall, but is there, is there any type of materials that you could use to make the retaining wall smaller so you're not cutting the path into the field? Because I would hate to take up any of the field. Um, with a path. So Megan, you um, have looked at this more than I have. I don't think we're taking away any of the field. I think it would be within the footprint of the existing pathway that's out there. Is that correct? Oh, you're muted, Megan. Megan, yes. oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to find my mouse. That's okay. Um, yeah, so we're not, so the, the new, the new path is essentially in the same location as the existing path, which is in the in the outfield. It's all encroaching on the outfield. Um, but we aren't like moving it into the out, you know, we aren't taking more of the outfield. It's just that we can't get a full outfield. Okay. Um, yeah. Which that's, is the existing condition. Yeah, yeah. I wish we could. Um, but that being said, we can definitely look at the materials of the wall to make sure that that entrance still feels welcoming. Um, mm -hmm. Part of what we just want to make sure is that there's an ADA accessible entrance from the Walnut Street edge, which there isn't currently. Um, so that's part of what we just, we're, we're trying to make sure that because that's the only entrance on that side of the park that we are able to make sure that we can get, you know, visitors with wheelchairs are able to also um, enter there. But it's a really good point and it's good to know about the rat problem over there as well um, so that we can take that into consideration as we're coming up with the final details. Okay. And oh, to answer the lighting question, I knew there was another one, I was glad I took notes. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't, um, from a parks perspective, put in lighting like in the surfacing, it's just, it's not maintainable with um, snow and other things and, and mm -hmm. just the equipment that we have but we'll definitely in the final design be looking at lighting. And we don't um, typically light parks for um, use at night because we don't want kind of negative behaviors to happen, but we do light for safety, um, especially if you know there are parks. And I'm assuming that, that Crawford may be one of these that people use for circulation, potentially for um, commuting or that sort of thing, kind of walking from you know through the park, which is why mm -hmm. we also wanted to make sure that there was an accessible route from Walnut to Crawford, kind of going all the way through the park, um, which we don't have currently. Um, so lighting is definitely for safety is part of what we'll be looking at. And um, and actually, I didn't even realize it was on the um, the plan that's on there where it says pedestrian scale light. Um, so that's oh, yeah. something that we will be looking at, especially at some of those entrances and the pathways in. Um, but we don't necessarily light, you know, the playground to a point that. Um, it's, it's comfortable for use, but more for safety. Right. If that okay. makes sense. Yes. Okay. And just one more thing. There's of an course. apartment building on the Walnut side and their trash is their dumpster is right at the, um, like it's right there. So I would imagine that as, that's just more, if there's something, a way to work with the apartment building is either to move the dumpster because you have seating there. Um, I'm sure no one wants to smell trash and things. Yeah, no, that's good to know. Let's take a look at that, Megan, next time we're out there. Sure thing, definitely. I like the uh, walk, the um, structure that you had over the hill, kind of. You had some kind of play structure and you. Next. the wooden that was very nice and you know and then the thing you mentioned about having something like to, that you could look down into one of the other playgrounds some kind of tall structure you mentioned mm -hmm. yeah and one of the it's 
It's interesting. A lot of people, um, it sounds counterintuitive that topography and slopes can really be good for accessibility um, in a playground, which feels really weird. But what's great about this is it's almost like a little ramp. So, you know, kids in wheelchairs or caregivers in wheelchairs with mobility issues can get to both levels of the playground. So they can, you know, go around the ADA path and get to the bottom level of the playground. But from the top, they can actually wheel onto the top of a structure and use the play elements at the top. So it's a really exciting, um, like it sounds counterintuitive, but it's it's really helpful to have that topography so that um, kids and caregivers um, with mobility issues can also play along too. What are those ball? What are these big balls? Is that just something like a um, for decorative or? Is that so those are actually. Um, it, they are sort of like a play element. Mm -hmm. They're made out of the, um, it's like a harder version of the rubber safety surface. So they're pretty firm and you can balance from one to another, you know, jump from one to another, climb if you're like a littler, a littler person. Um, yeah. They can also be set into the hill. Um, so you only see half. So there's like more of a height difference. And um, when they're on the hill, it's like they sort of kind of become something you scramble up to kind of get to the top mm, of the hill, like, like where these, um, where the slides are, like you could put them on that slope that's next to those slides. And even on the surface, you can mount some that are full round and some that are half. And so they just become like another climbing um, element, just, you know, sometimes kids stand on them and play King of the Hill or Queen right. of the Hill um, and, you know, just have, you know, make up their own games with them which is kind of fun rock climbing right yeah, yeah it's oh. like it's like modern contemporary yeah. rock climbing wall is yeah. very nice have a rock climbing wall those are very nice to have too yes can so. can we see um option a with the with yeah the play structure or the plan the plan, because I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to wrap my head around the play part versus the, like, I do like the, the idea of having that, like, gazebo, that pergola in the middle, but then I was trying to see around, A, the playground is completely separate, right? Right. So I will say I like B because it breaks because it provides additional, uh, that pergola doesn't leave any too much open space. It leaves enough, but it doesn't. So like if someone, like if you're walking along the path, you know, there's a pergola there. So there's likely to be people there. Um, and it connects, the pergola really connects the ballpark to the playground. And so if you're a parent and you have kids in the playground, but you're you know, your daughter might be playing softball over there, you could kind of volley between the two without mm -hmm. feeling, because the playground and option B is set back, which I like as well. Mm -hmm. So can I ask a question about water play? So water play, we also showed two options. And again, it can work either way in either option. Um, but we showed it more associated with the playground, and then we showed it more associated with sort of that central plaza space. Um, and even if we had a central plaza space with a pergola, the water play could still be part of the playground. So what do you mm -hmm. guys think? Do you guys think it's nice to have it separated a little bit, or do you think it's better to have it closer to the playground? I vote for closer to the playground because kids can run back and forth. Yeah, I think Which so. most kids are going to like to do. Sorry, Hazel. No, no, I agree. And what about exercise equipment? So we had heard that people thought exercise equipment would be a good idea at the first meeting. And we looked at two different locations here, but also two different types of equipment. One that was sort of a bigger station that had a lot of pieces on it and one that was sort of a couple individual pieces. Um, do you guys have any thoughts about where the location will be best, near the field or near the playground? Hmm. Put it near the playground, then you're gonna to have to use some of the 
space the children, huh? So the, the children will have to lose. That's true. So we'll put it near the field. Yeah, I would agree. Because I know that at Walnut Park, there is a guy who does boxing in the park, which is okay. nice. Um, mm -hmm. But I wonder if like in the back part of the field, would it, I don't know if it would obstruct it or maybe somewhere near the pergola without invading the park space. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, no. You know how you have pushed the park back in plan B? Yeah. I wonder if you could put the, um, so there's that tree lined ear. I think that's Crawford. Um, is I wonder if you could put eek out a little corner there where the the entrance, or is it that that's the back? Forgive me. Um, so if I'm looking at the little pea pod of the playground, yes. And if you go to the right, to the back, and then up. Yeah, over there. I wonder if that could be, or even in the bottom corner, if that could be like the exercise area with a few different pieces because one large structure means you're on top of one another. But if you have a few individuals, then people can use it and then move. You can do like um, a circuit. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. Let's take a look at, um, Megan, where we could um, put some of those. So I think one of the things that we'll have to look at and we can get back to you guys at, that, at our next meeting is um, like Megan was saying earlier, there's so much topography down where the playground is that there may not be enough flat surfaces to put some of the exercise equipment um, mm. in those locations that you guys were just talking about. Um, it, it, but if the concern is putting it in the flatter spaces takes away from kids, we could still take a look sort of near the field um, in some of those perimeter pathways and could still potentially spread them out almost like a circuit. So let us take a look from a from a topography um, standpoint and see if we spread it out where we could fit those in in option B. Okay, I I, I I'm going to advocate for the circuit piece because then people could run between the apparatuses. So even True. if it's on a hill or something like that, you know, it gives a little more. Um, effort that has to be made around and so people might likely use it more so that's a good point um let's see i'm trying to think of other other questions to just check in on um sounds like people are interested in a pergola shade shelter here as well um what about styles of play here because it's one of the things that we looked at a lot and Megan I don't know can we look at the um I think it was option A older kids um playground and one of the things that we heard at the first meeting was that the playground was definitely undersized for the amount of kids that use it especially from the school so one of the things we were looking at is this piece of play equipment and also the other ones um they definitely have a lot of places where kids can spread out and you can get a lot of kids on one piece of equipment. Um, and so that's part of what we were looking at between the two different kind of older kids um, structures. Cause even, you know, even with the age of kids at, at the Ellis, um, kids kind of outgrow the sort of toddler age structure pretty quickly. And most kids gravitate towards the older one, even, even mine when they were three, were trying to get on the big ones. Um, so I'm just curious between these sort of, um, kind of expanded larger kid structures if they're either of them feel um, feel like a better fit for the school and the kids and we'll we'll definitely be getting their feedback when they get back from school too. Mm -hmm. I, I like the one on the lower left the blue with the blue slides mm -hmm. um, and thinking from a teacher point of view is like, if I'm the gym teacher, I can go out and do a whole obstacle course on something like that for kids of any age. Um, but you can, uh, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm in a community, I wanna take my niece to the park. I think I could maybe consider having a baby slide, not a baby baby slide, but a smaller side to slide to accommodate the younger children if you're mm -hmm. gonna go with um, one full, piece. So just to clarify, 
if we did this option, we would also have that younger kid structure at the top right. Okay. So we would okay. have, we would still have a younger kids, um, even, even with an expanded older kids structure. Or, oh, okay. or the, the younger kids structure also could be like any other style of younger kids structure too. It doesn't have to be that funky, like hexagon thing either. Okay. Yeah. Although that is good for teaching that some shape. Nice. Hexagon thing is nice. You like that one, Hazel? Yeah. I like that. That's for the younger kids, that hexagon thing there? Mm -hmm. Exactly. I yeah, like so that's, it's, it's classified for two to five, um, but it's pretty cool. So I could see other kids getting back on it too. Mm -hmm. And the one at the bottom is nice because you can see how the children can kind of spread out. So that's good, you know, because children, you know, some children like a lot of space around them and some children like to be grouped together. So that way you have an option. Mm -hmm. the one thing i would like to see we uh, i don't know if they do like um monkey bars and i the monkey bars could be just in there but mm -hmm. maybe like a climbing apparatus more of um i don't know if you all i might be dating myself but when i was growing up it was like a half moon and it had like triangles in it, but it was all like, you can climb all on it. Yeah. And that's always fun. Um, so if you needed something additional to put there, something like that, where kids can, you can either walk all the way up or, you know, you can climb, you can do whatever. I, it's just another option to build kids' imaginations. Um, you know, you could go and hide in it too. Um, mm -hmm. we'll see through, but. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. And um, it's a little hard to tell in this structure, but um, we can definitely go into more detail about components at the next meeting. But mm -hmm. the, this structure, um, like just and only because I know these pieces of equipment and they're a little hard to read at this scale, but there's probably three different things on there that would be considered monkey bars or okay. upper body kind of climbing things. Um, mm -hmm. including some that kind of start at the ground and wrap up so that you kind of work your way up and others that okay. are just directly across. Um, it's just a little hard to tell in that picture. But like I said, we can go into some more detail and show individual components because what's cool about a structure like this is you can kind of pick and choose and you can sort of add some different pieces into it too. Okay. What do you guys think about musical instruments and equipment? Just because it's on this page, I figured I might as well ask. I think it's great. They should definitely, mm -hmm. you know, they love the, the drums or the um, little xylophone things. Yeah, those are good. Mm -hmm. um, using, it, it might be nice to utilize um, equipment. Like, you know how when you have like, there's a metal, cause we don't want anything to be touching the kid's lips. But when you tap on different parts, it's like a steel drum, but mm -hmm. it could be in the shape of a, of a um, uh, a horn or something. So as kids tap, you can hear the different sounds coming out. Those are always fun um, okay. for kids. I do. I love musical and anything to to push kids' imaginations. Okay. And sorry, Megan, I keep asking all sorts of questions. I don't know if you have any. I'm not trying to take over. <laughs> no, no, you're doing a great job asking questions. <laughs> um, so is there anything, I guess, part of the questions um, that I would have next then is, is there anything that um, there are hopes or thoughts that people have of what they'd like to see in the park that we haven't talked about here? Oh, wow, we did that well, huh? It looks like you covered it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it looks like you covered it. Um, we have okay. ample seating. Um, I, I just, I, I'm a big advocate of whatever seating is there, it's not movable um, yeah. and it's mm -hmm. hard to break. Um, so, whatever that is. Yeah, our standard in Boston Park is to have things that are um, mounted and not movable. Um, okay. So that, that goes along with our, our standards. So that's good to hear. 
And I wonder if one of the benches at each of the park, if you're going to do metal benches, could actually have the park name in car like as part of the back so it would say Crawford instead of having the flats it'll say Crawford Park or um, Walnut Street Park. Yeah that's a that's a great idea for you know identifying you know mm -hmm. having something custom to the park. There's a bunch of bench companies that do that kind of thing nicely. Mm -hmm. Yeah that's a fun idea. And then the last thing I would say is just color. Um, I color um, is good um, for activating again imagination and creativity. So having something like that would be nice. And since they don't have anything like um, sand at playgrounds anymore, is there anything that you can? replace it with that children can kind of create their own building thing with, you know, I don't know how, to, I don't know if it would be an attached block to a wall or something or some kind of maze. I've seen at some playgrounds, they have like a wall and they have this like uh, one playground I was at with my granddaughter, they had like a spaceship and it would go through this little like uh, maze kind of thing. And, you know, they go to the different planets and they had the names of planets on the mm -hmm. wall. I don't know how to, it was like a rocket ship going through a maze, but it was all attached to the wall or mm -hmm. a thing that was movable, you know, where the children could kind of build something with, you know. <laughs> I, I know exactly what you're talking about, Hazel. Yeah, and it is tough because with, um, especially in urban environments with sand, it's just, it, they become unfortunately animal litter boxes. And just from a safety perspective, it's really hard um, to keep them um, healthy, I think is a good way to put that. Um, and so that's the reason that we've been going away from those, but it does unfortunately take away that kind of tactile manipulatable element of play. Um, so I love that suggestion. And there are a lot of, like you were saying, um, as part of some of these structures, they, you know, companies have panels that have some of those manipulables on there. Um, and sometimes there are even like standalone pieces too. So we'll definitely take a look at that to make sure that we don't lose that, um, that tactile kind of um, type of play without elements like sand. Yeah. And those, those can also be tied into like a, like a theme also, you know, so if, you know, the school, like the solar system or like, you know, I don't know, wild animals. I, I'm not sure what, there's so many, you know, so many things, so many directions yeah. that can go. Is there a space at Crawford for, um, just to incorporate the, the children at the Ellis and the community children, thinking about how, like at Walnut, there was that wall that was gonna be colored. And I'm wondering if there's a way for the kids at the schools or the kids in the community to do some sort of artwork and have it put on a structure so that it, it's like forever it's living there. Um, even maybe having um, some of our local artists, um, black and brown artists come and do, uh, have a little installment there as well. Um, because, you know, the majority of the community um, are people of color, and I think mm -hmm. we should celebrate um, the rich history of Crawford Street and Walnut Park. So, but I do want to just echo bringing in the, the creativity and imagination of the kids. So mm -hmm. even having a contest for, you know, one for every grade, and the kids get to pick who gets their artwork post, like, imaged onto the building or, or you know, on into the playground somehow, some way. Um, and then it also, to me, that would foster, you know, families to go and be like, oh, let me go see what my, you know, baby did and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. And so, and so you'll get more use out of the park. I think that's a really fun idea. And the Ellis has been really great about chatting with us thus far. So hopefully we can coordinate something with that. 
Um, and I love the idea of having the kids participate in some of that. Um, and in terms of, and this is just because I've learned a lot during my Malcolm X Park project as well, um, in terms of local artists, um, if it's actually a local artist that is professionally an artist, I'm not sure if that's the right way to put it, because not that our kids aren't artists, because they absolutely are, um, but a professional artist working on something in a park actually has to, it, it becomes considered public art and has to go through a full arts commission process, which we're doing at Malcolm X right now, trying to um, get local artists to work on some murals in that park as well. Um, so it might be easier um, to include, and again, with that creativity with the kids, um, to work with the kids, um, because it is quite a process, um, having just gone through it at Malcolm X Park too. That makes sense. Um, but yeah, let me, let me reach out to the Ellis School. I'm not sure if they're going to be answering too many emails over the summer. I hope for their sake they're not. Um, but I will reach out to them and see if we can, because we've talked about getting the kids input on the playground itself. Um, but that's a whole other kind of um, level of engagement that hopefully they'll be excited about too. Great. Let's see, is there, um, is there anything else or any other thoughts that anybody has on these? Not for me. Well, thank you guys. This has been really wonderful and a lot of really good feedback. So I really appreciate all of that. Um, like we were saying earlier, our next steps are to take all the feedback that we've gotten here. Um, what we may do is also do a survey to try to get um, some broader community input as well, um, just to make sure that we're hearing as many voices as we can for um, the renovation. And we'll take all of that input that we get and we will um, be putting together sort of a final concept for each of the parks so that when we come back, we'll show you guys one concept that sort of progressed all of these ideas that we've talked about um, and make sure that we heard you guys. Did, did we hear, did we get it right? Um, are there things that we should tweak? Um, so we'll be doing that this fall. Um, and I and if I don't have your guys' email addresses, if you haven't gotten emails from me, um, please feel free to put your email in the chat and I'll make sure that I add you guys to my email list for when we have our next meeting um, and just to keep you guys posted. And if we do a survey um, to send you guys that link so we can have you guys um, you know, put your input in there, but also to be able to share it with friends or neighbors that might also be interested. So I think that's really our next step on our end is to, to get back to work and then share more with you guys. That sounds good. Yes, please keep me informed. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm um, gonna put my email in. It just takes me a little while. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I won't shut it down. Don't worry. I'll, I'll give you time. All right. So Lauren, when we pick a yeah. date, for the next um, meeting that mm -hmm. will be on the project website, it will be emailed to anyone who has provided their email and um, what else? It will be flyered. Yes, we will post. also, exactly, flyered in the surrounding, um, surrounding streets. And then we also laminate flyers and post them in the park as well, in both parks. You don't have any idea when it's going to be in the fall, do you? We're thinking right now, mid-September. Um, we don't have a date scheduled yet, but what we were hoping for was to make it, like we postponed it a week or two from where we originally thought, just because we'd like to make sure that the kids are back at the Ellis and that we can make sure that we can get um, some, some kid involvement too. That's just because we, we don't want them to not be able to do input just because we're doing it over the summer. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yes, yeah, so we don't have a date yet, but we are thinking um, mid-September. Now who should, so I should call 311 about the um, Franklin Park up here, the uh, playground, Tiffany Law. Tiffany, Tiffany Moore? Yeah, it's really, that playground is in very bad condition. So yeah. If I call 311, a lot of parts of the uh, equipment are just, you know, kind of broken and they've been broken for about 20 years, so. 
Yeah, I would say for sure with broken equipment, you know, if they're broken equipment, trash cans that haven't been emptied, that sort of thing, that's definitely a 311. If okay. it's a question about um, wanting a park to be renovated, okay. um, which is a bigger capital um, project, that's something that you could send me an email since you have my contact information and I'm happy to pass it along. Another good way to try to bump projects up the ladder of full park renovation is city councilor's offices. Um, and you know, yours might, you know, your, your district office might have a little bit more say right now. Yeah. Now what's your, your email again? Is, I uh, let me put that in, I'll put it in the um, chat for you guys right now as well. Thank you. I almost put, yeah, that doesn't help to put my, uh, I'm just typing my husband's accidentally. That doesn't help anybody. Okay. Um, oh, the other thing I promised you guys I would put in there is um, the, um, website for the project. So let me, Find that really quickly and I will drop that in the chat too so then that way you guys have that as well there we go thank you so much Tamara it was been really really good feedback thank you have a good night Thank you, you too. Thank you guys all for coming tonight and, and share and share with your friends and, and let them know to reach out if they have any thoughts. Okay, thank you, great job. I enjoyed the meeting. Thank, thank you. you so much, right, Daniel, thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you, Lars. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, everybody. Cool. All right.